Good afternoon. Welcome to Westminster Wednesday, episode number 17. It's great to be together. Today we're going to be thinking about God's providence. But before we do that, let's pray. God, our Heavenly Father, we do pause now and we pray for your help as we try to deal with a topic which is challenging and which is, in a sense, far beyond us. We pray that you would give us much wisdom and understanding. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, we've been working our way through the Westminster Confession of Faith, and we find ourselves in chapter 5. So last time we looked at creation, and this time we're going to be thinking about the way God governs creation, the way God orders all things. We've talked a little bit already about the what's called the eternal decree of God. And the eternal decree of God, we saw, was the way that he decides and plans all things. Well, providence is, is far more concerned with, well, concern's probably the wrong word. Providence is the description of how God does it. So how God causes all things to come about. And so in our confession in chapter 5, we're going to be looking at the first four points. The first four points deal with, I guess, the the fact of providence, like what providence is. And then there's another three sections which which deal with the, the purpose and the outworking and the result of the providence of God. So you've got first just the fact of providence, but then what the providence means. What's the conclusion? And so chapter 5, verses 1 through 4, verse section, probably a better word, read like the following. God, the great creator of all things, doth uphold, direct, dispose, and govern all creatures, actions, and things, from the greatest, even to the least, by his most wise and holy providence, according to his infallible foreknowledge and the free and immutable counsel of his own will, to the praise of the glory of his wisdom, power, justice, goodness, and mercy. Although in relation to the foreknowledge and decree of God, the first cause, all things come to pass immutably and infallibly, yet by the same providence, he ordereth them to fall out according to the nature of second causes, either necessarily, freely, or contingently. God, in his ordinary providence, makes use of means, yet is free to work without, above, and against them, at his pleasure. The almighty power, unsearchable wisdom, and infinite goodness of God so far manifest themselves in his providence that it extendeth itself even to the first fall and all other sins of angels and men, and that not by a bare permission, but such as hath joined with it a most wise and powerful bounding, and otherwise ordering and governing of them in a manifold dispensation to his own holy ends. Yet so as the sinfulness thereof proceedeth only from the creature and not from God, who being most holy and righteous, neither is nor can be the author or approver of sin. So we get these, these, these four points in the confession about the providence of God. We get these four points. And the first couple we've, we've kind of already inter- interacted with when we talked about the eternal decree of God. So if, if you didn't join us for chapter, I think it was chapter two off the top of my head, not sure about what's going on with the lighting, so we're just going to have to deal with it. But in chapter 2, we talked about the fact that God's decree was fixed and sure and perfect. And here now in chapter 5, those sorts of themes are being picked up and dealt with again. So in section 1, the authors comment that God does everything and acts everything out according to that eternal decree. So in 1 and 2, we see that, the, I guess, the, the driving force behind the providence of God 
is the eternal decree of God. Let's shut this curtain. So that my lighting hopefully stops going bad. So the eternal decree of God is what controls the providence of God. So the eternal decree sets the plan, is another way of thinking about it, like the architect who sets the plan, and then the builder builds the house. Well, the, the eternal decree of God is like the architect's plan. And the providence of God is the way that God unravels it and unrolls it out into history. And so in section one, the authors comment that he upholds, directs, disposes, and governs all creatures, all actions, all things, from the greatest to the least, according to his holy providence. Now, what falls outside of that? What falls outside of all things, all actions, all creatures, from greatest to least? Of course, the answer is nothing. The reason the planet Earth continues to spin, the reason your lungs continue to contract, the reason your heart continues to beat, is because of God's holy providence. The reason that the bird outside my house that's tweeting right now continues to tweet is because God's providence causes it to do so. And so the biggest thing they want to stress right off the bat is that everything falls under this according to his perfect counsel alone. So he doesn't do it in response to things. We saw this under the eternal decree. He doesn't do it in response to what he knows, but he makes the decision and causes it to happen. But then secondly, it happens in point two there. It happens as a response or as a flow out of his perfect decree. And he does it through secondary causes. Now, we talked a bit about this, so we won't delve into this too deeply again. I'd encourage you to go back to the eternal decree section where we talked about secondary causes. But in a nutshell, it's 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 our way of expressing the way that God ordains, decrees, and by his providence causes things to happen, yet isn't directly, in a sense, doing it. So, for example, I breathe in and out. My lungs are doing it. That's the first cause, or that's the, sorry, that's the secondary cause, is my lungs breathing in and out. But the first cause is God. So God causes through my lungs breath to come in and out so he does it through secondary causes in other words he doesn't just magically make you stay alive he causes your body to keep you alive so he does it according to his will it impacts everything and he does it through secondary causes and now these point three and four are probably i think additions or or new information in comparison to our study of the eternal decree so point three, God in his ordinary providence makes use of means, yet is free to work without, above, or um, or against as his pleasure. So what's this talking about? So there was a there was a there was a huge argument in the theological world about a century ago around, around miracles. D does can God do miracles? Now I'm not talking about the continuation of and cessation argument, which is that God no longer needs to work in these ways because we've got the word of God. But I'm talking about the liberal persuasion, which argued that God never has and never does miracles. So all of the things in the Old Testament that appear to be miracles are actually just secondary causes rolling out. So for example, the, the 10 plagues, they argued that most of those plagues could have happened by natural means. Uh, the flood could have happened by natural means only. So God never violates, never violates his order of creation. Now, what the divines are saying is quite the opposite. They're saying, generally speaking, God uses secondary causes to bring things into effect. Generally speaking, he causes things to happen the natural way. Things fall out of a tree because of gravity. A hurricane 
will flatten a nation. A plague will stop a world. And generally speaking, he works through the natural order of creation. Yet, they want to say, he is free to work outside of that. So God is not bound by the order of creation. If God wanted to cause the apple in the tree to go up instead of down, he has the power and the ability to do that. And we see that in miracles. Jesus walking on water. Now, when you stand on water, you sink. That's the way gravity and mass and everything else works. You sink through water. But God is able to work against that at his pleasure. So Jesus walked on top of the water. Or take the bread, be feeding 5,000 people. Ordinarily speaking, five loaves of bread don't feed 5,000 people. But God is able to work above what creation says. And this is really important because it's about biblical truth. It's about how we understand God's power over creation. And so what we see here is the reality that we take God at his word. And so we believe that, generally speaking, he works in accordance with the rules of creation that he has made. And yet, he is not limited by them. He is able to act freely, at his pleasure, in the way he wants. And so sometimes, generally, well, let me say this again a different way. Generally speaking... We will take medicine and go to the doctors and use ordinary secondary means to recover. But every once in a while, someone gets healed miraculously. God decides to remove a cancer in response to prayer. Sometimes God does that. He works outside of the ordinary means of creation to bring about some different event. Now, not only is the providence of God at work, generally speaking, in an ordinary way. But we see in point four here that God's providence extends to everything. And they, they really want to stress this. And it's really important that we stress this, that there's not a single place which is outside of the providence of God. And so the authors write in point four that the almighty power, wisdom, goodness of God, manifest themselves in his providence, and that it extends even to the first four. And so this is sort of like their, their, their backwards limit. Their backwards limit is even the fall is under the providence of God. And all other sins of angels and men, so that would include the fall of angels, that they don't happen by bare permission, but, but by abounding, ordering, governing. So what are they saying here? So firstly, it covers everything. It goes back to the fall, back to angels, back to everything. So there's nothing that Adam and Eve didn't rebel outside of God's control, outside of God's providence. So some people will say that God set them up freely and they made the decision and then God had to respond to that. Well, what we saw when we looked at the eternal decree was that God plans everything. And so the fall falls within that eternal decree. And so does it fall under his providence. God and his providence directed, controlled, or the words that the men here use, they bound, ordered, and were governed by God's providence. But notice that this this, this language isn't just bare permission, they say. It, it, it's not bare permission. It's not that God sits back and goes, oh, I'll allow that to happen. So sometimes people will speak about negative uh, negative events in this way. If you think about a tragedy in someone's life, they'll say something like, oh, it's not that God planned it, but it's that God allowed it to happen. The, the problem with that is it, it paints God out to be a, person who doesn't isn't really in control so the bad stuff comes out of nowhere and he has to consider whether he's going to let it happen or not the problem is that that's not that doesn't 
run coherently with what we find in the scriptures. Because what we find in the scriptures is what? God hardening Pharaoh's heart. God bringing a messenger of the devil to keep Paul humble. What we see in the scriptures is a God who is powerfully governing every single event to ensure that things happen the way he wants. And what this means is every single event in your life is meaningful. This is huge. Like, this is massive for us as believers. And we're going to see this next week when we look at the outcome of God's providence. But but I think one huge takeaway from the providence is, is not to try and wrestle and and wonder how God can can be the one who's planning everything and yet not be the author of sin. Like they're gonna, they, we, they, they mention that. They say God is not the author of sin. And, and we just believe that. We hold on to that because that's what the Bible said. God is righteous and perfect and he's not the author of sin. We are. But, you know, God's providence shouldn't lead us to argue that. What God's providence should do is cause us to find hope and comfort because everything has a meaning. Because if your cancer comes in the providence of God, according to his holy wisdom, that means there's a purpose at the end of it. If you being abused comes at the end from God, then that means you have great comfort and wisdom because God is in control. It means every decision has infinite meaning. And that's hopeful. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your providence and the way that you order all things in our life. There there is a huge amount of mystery here, but it's a subject which is far too deep for 15 minutes. And we pray that you would help us just to rest in your beautiful control. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, thanks so much for tuning in with me for another Westminster Wednesday. We will be back here next week for another. Otherwise, we'll be back here tomorrow for another daily devotion, for our last daily devotion in the book of Revelation, before turning to Matthew. Well, I hope you have a most blessed afternoon and evening, and I will see you back here tomorrow for another daily devotion.